Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. We're glad you decided to check us out. God has a specific message of hope for your life and mine today. So listen up. It seems like in our culture there's a rise to new, this new wave almost of, of, of apologetic attack to the existence of God. I mean, it's always been there. It's, it's never been gone away or anything like that, but, but, it's, uh, but it seems like there's a new rise. And I think one of the reasons is that we were kind of spoiled and have been for a while because for a long time it was so ingrained in our culture that no one really would give it a credible question too much. But that's, that's just not the case. Now, I think what happened in our Christian culture is over generations, we got kind of lazy and there were things that we forgot or things that we don't understand anymore. And it makes it harder when someone brings a full-on kind of assault and says, hey, he doesn't exist. You need to prove this to me. And we don't have the answers that we need sometimes. Anybody felt like that? I know I have. I mean, sometimes people say stuff to me. I'm like, okay, well, how, do I, how do I come back and answer that? You know, and part of this whole series, I want to believe, but, is, is, is trying to answer some of these questions because as you talk to people who say that God doesn't exist, or as you see it in culture, or you read about it, or you hear, you hear someone discuss their thoughts at length, really what you end up seeing is that, is that really as they play out who they think God is and, and who they say this is that doesn't exist, you start to realize that, you know what, they're not really rejecting the true God of Scripture. They're rejecting some sort of distorted view of God that really isn't Him. You know, and, and, and that's what we tried to deal with with a few, a, a couple times in this series. You know, we dealt with uh, the on-demand God. And that's the God that if God doesn't give me what I want, you know, if I don't ask God, if I, I've asked God for things, and they may have been really, really, I've really, really wanted them. And they meant a whole lot. And I knew that these things would mean a whole lot to me. And they would change my life. And then God didn't show up. Or it may have been something serious. Like you may have been the teenager that was praying for your, your, your parents. Oh, Lord, please, please, please don't let them, make them stop fighting. And then when they did, they didn't stop fighting like you thought they would. And they, they, they divorced. And you said, they thought they loved Jesus. But, they, but I don't know what's going on. And, and you, you question God. And maybe in crisis of faith like that. And this on-demand God. And what we learned was that God is not a God who just, We don't want a God necessarily who just does everything we think. Because we, we can tend to think some things that are pretty off base. There's been things that I've asked God to do at times. That I, in, in retrospect, I'm like, I'm so glad you didn't do that. You know, because that would have been a mess. You know, and, and there's a lot of things, and I believe, and we learn to trust that God is loving, He is faithful, He's never, He's always going to be there for us, He's not going to react rashly or out of character, we can always trust the levelness of His character, He's not going to be someone who at, overreacts and loses His temper with us, and he's, he's, he's trying to make a world such that He brings us to a joyous life that we, possibly, we couldn't possibly dream or imagine any other way, but God is planning for this you know, for us, he's bringing us to closer to him. And we can trust that part of him, even when we don't get the things that we want. And we talked about last week, about God, the killjoy God. And how, everybody, you know, I grew up with it. God's no fun. He just, every, pretty much everything that you think is fun to do, that must be against, there must have a Bible, a Bible verse that says that's terrible. And, you know, and I mean, you know, and I thought that, you know, I did. You know, I was like, you know, if I have fun, oh no, I feel bad, God. I'm sorry I had fun. I confess the sin of fun to you. You know, and that's, how that's crazy, because, you know, God, it just doesn't match with what God says in Scripture. You know, I'm not... You know, the life that I can possibly ever dream or imagine that's greater than anything like that. He talks about in John 10, 10. You know, that's not something that is not fun. You know, God created fun. He's got a reason for it. You know, but we talked about what is that God is trying to not cr create a, a situation. We have so many rules that we cannot keep. The truth is we can't keep the rules. And God knew that. That's why he created the law so that we would know we needed him. Right? And what God is that? Here's the thing I didn't talk about last week. Here's the deal that God's really trying to do, and this may blow your mind. He's trying to create a people that don't need rules. 
He's trying to make rules obsolete. That is what the gospel is doing. You know, and then we talked about that. Next week we're going to talk about a really tough subject. It's going to be called the heartless God. It's the God that doesn't care. You know, that's going to be a tough one. You know, why does, why, God, why do you let this happen? Why did you let that happen? Why did this tragedy happen? Why didn't you fix this? Why didn't you stop that? You know, and we're going to talk about how that meshes with the view of God. And a lot of people think that because God lets something happen in their lives or around them or something that they can't intellectually reconcile, that God either doesn't exist or he's not who he says he is. And we're going to talk about that next week. T today, we talk about a different kind of view of God. You know, it's the God that, uh, you know, that, that, I, that I got to feel. I'm going to call that the view called the goosebumps God. You know, I mean, you know, I got I to gotta feel it, you know. And I don't know, if, if you ever come to church before and, you know, I, I don't know, you've been in a, in a really powerful worship song or something and, and you've really felt God. Has anybody felt, has that happened to anybody before? You've felt God or you've seen God in a situation that's happened. It's happened to some of us. Yes, absolutely. We've, we've, we've seen that happen in our lives. But I, I, I want to say to this to you, though, I mean, I, I, when you say that maybe in, or maybe in your everyday life and something that's happened, you felt God's presence in where you are. How do you know that you felt God's presence? How do you know? I mean, was it, was it a cool feeling? Did you get really emotional about it? Was it a grand sense of relief at a time that you couldn't understand? Or was it just peace? Or what, how do you know that came from God? Because I'll be honest with you, you know, if you want me to get emotional, you can put on that Diamond Dallas Page yoga video where the guy's really fat and walking with, and at the end he's running, and I'm just going to be, I'm going to be waterworks, man. You know, this, this whole oh, Alabama boy is just going to be crying. I mean, you know, you can do that with a lot of things, you know. I mean, there's a lot of things that can make you emotional. There's a lot of things that can give you relief. There's a lot of things that can do that. How do you know that it was God? You know, and, and, and for some people, they come into maybe a worship service, you know, and they sit here and everybody's raising their hands and, and, and they're like, you know, I don't feel it. I just don't. And, you know, I've been there. I've been there. You know, I don't feel it. Everybody else seems like they're feeling it. Maybe I, if I do that, maybe I'll feel it. Maybe if I do this number right here, I'll do it. I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, and, 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 it, and it's a hard moment to reconcile sometimes for people. And they think, because I want to believe, you know, but I can't feel him. And because I can't feel him, then he must not be real. You know, some people have a problem believing because, because of this feeling thing. And what they bought into is a distorted view of God that just produces goosebumps all over the place. You know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just, just, just throw this out at you. If you're following Christ, if you're a human, there's going to be some, I'm going to put it this way. If you are a human being on the planet that is conscious, you're going to have a time that you don't feel that God is near. Amen. It's going to happen. And I'm going to go one further. If you are following Jesus... There will probably be a time, well, I'm, no, probably. There's going to be a time that you will feel like that I don't, I don't know if I feel God right at this very moment. It's going to happen to you. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. You know, it happened to me in seminary. <laughs> That's great. You know, you're, like, hey, you're paying all this money to go learn how to be a pastor. And you get there and you start questioning the existence of God. Yeah, I did. There was a moment, you know, when I was in seminary and I'm learning all these things and all this stuff's coming at me and I'm going, what if he's not there? Are you there? Is this real? You know, is this something I just concocted in my head? You know, and this is a career change and I got emotional about it. What is it? And I had to go through that and make a choice on my own. You know, because there are times that you're going to feel like that. And I'm going to tell you something else. If you don't feel God at some point, you are not alone. That's what I'm trying to let you know. In fact, you're even in, in company with some really, really big heavy hitters in Scripture. You know, there was, uh, you know, you, you look at the Psalms. <laughs> Half of the Psalms is David whining, going, "Where God, where are you? Where are you at? I need some help. They're chasing me. Why are you doing something? You know, half of the Psalms are that. I mean, it's like you, you want to talk about venting? You know, my wife told me one time, she said, the Psalms are pretty much venting. That's what the Psalms, a lot of, a lot of the Psalms are venting. That's, but gets someone venting to God like we should, not venting to our neighbor and complaining to them. You know, it's venting to the Lord, you know. I mean, there's other people. You look at uh, Jeremiah. You know, he was a prophet, and you, you, maybe, you, maybe to you, you felt God when you prayed for something and something happened, or something you needed happened at a certain time. Well, he preached for 40 years, and nobody listened to him. You know, that's hard. So if, you, if you're God of result, if you're goosebump that you feel from the Lord as a result in some way, here he's praying, and nah, it's not happening. They're not listening to me. Okay, God, I'll go tell him again, you know. I mean, where are you? Are you going to show up? You know, nobody's listening. You know, and I'll be honest with you, there's, a, there's another one. There's a pretty heavy hitter. <laughs> that was Jesus. What if I told you that there was a time that Jesus didn't feel God? You know, in, in um, 
Matthew chapter 27. You know, we, we, talk, we just celebrated Easter, and we talked about Jesus on the cross. And there was a time when he, he was on the cross, and it said, from four, at, at, at Matthew 27, 45, and 46, it said, from noon until three. In the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which means, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is right before he died. You know what he's saying? Where are you at? I don't feel you. Why did you run out? I'm going to tell you a few things we can learn real quickly about this before we talk about some things. There's some things that not feeling God does not mean. This is some things that it does not mean. Number one, it doesn't mean that God isn't there. And you can see that in Jesus' situation. You don't, you don't think God just said, okay, I'm just going to exit existence for a few seconds. No. You know, he was there. He was still doing things. He was still thinking. It, it, it doesn't mean that God isn't working. That's the second thing it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God isn't working if you can't feel God. You can obviously look at Jesus. I mean, at that position, God was doing some of the, the biggest heavy lifting that he was ever going to do. You know, there's no heavy lifting to God, but for us it looks heavy. You know, he was doing that. He was about to, Jesus was about to die on the cross. He was going to raise him again three days later. You know, it, if you don't feel God, it also doesn't mean that you're, not, that you're in the wrong place. Sometimes we feel like that. I don't feel God. Maybe I need to move. Maybe it's my problem. Maybe I need to get antsy. I'm going to do something different. That doesn't mean it. Jesus was in right the exact place that he needed to be. Right? He was dying on the cross for our sins. It also means this. It says, just because you can't feel God, it doesn't mean that something amazing isn't about to happen. Because something amazing was about to happen right here. Jesus was going to die on a cross. He was going to be raised again on the third day. And the hinge point of all Christendom and, and the entire existence of everything was going to be solidified right there. But that's some things that it doesn't automatically mean. It doesn't mean those things when you say that you can't feel God. But I want to tell you a few things too. There, what, so what are some things that, might, that it might mean if you don't feel God? And I want to talk about a couple of those. So what... what what does not feeling God, what not feeling God might mean? Here's the first thing that it might mean. It mean, might mean that you're putting too much emphasis on feelings. You know, I, I, the disciples were kind of in this boat as well. You know, they, they, um, they were in John chapter 6. You know, they were, they were meeting up with Jesus on the side of a lake. And, and they had this question. And, 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 you, and you see what they said in John 6.30. It says, so they asked him, they're talking to Jesus. What, what sign then will you give when we, so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna, ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now I want you to understand what they're saying is, is you know, when are you going to do something that I really feel so that I can believe in what you're doing. You need to set the stage here. <coughs> he just walked on water. Literally. He just did this. And can you imagine Jesus? He's like, so what kind of sign are you going to give us? And he's like, well, I just, you know, water. <laughs> on water. I mean, it, it, is that not enough? You know, and Jesus later on says, look, you know, it doesn't matter. You want bread falling from the sky? You know, I, I, I'm the son of God right here in front of you. I walked on water. What else do you want? You've been watching me heal people and all these, these huge things. And you still don't believe? What he was saying was, look, you know, it, it, he even said later on, he said, look, I'm, I'm here. You've seen me and you don't believe. What would bread from the sky going to do? What's it going to do for you? Because here's the thing that we have to understand about our feelings. You know, our, our feelings are always fleeting. They are never final. You realize that? Your feelings always change. And you may not think, well, I felt this way a long time. Well, you probably didn't feel that way for a few minutes and somewhere in the immediate midst of that. I know that in my life, I, my feelings have changed about things all the way through my life. It just depends on where I am at the moment. A lot of times, you know, sometimes, you know, my kids, it drives them nuts. You know, because dad's, you know, dad's like real sad or whatever. I mean, you know, I'm an extreme guy. That's what I do, you know. But fe your feelings change. You know, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you why. Sometimes your feelings, um, they don't, you know, every, uh, there's even long stretches of feelings. I may feel one way, but that will always change at some point in time. Let me tell you something about feelings. I'm horribly afraid of, of big, you know, you know, ferocious dogs. I just really am. I don't like that. When I was a little bitty kid, a uh, German Shepherd attacked me. I was about three or four, and I, I got too close to her puppies, and it scared the mess out of me, you know, and, and, and bit me, and I was, I was not, you know, I don't deal with dogs really well. And even in my lifetime, 
You know, I, I, even now I'm older, man. I'm, you know, I'm bigger. You know, I mean, I outweigh most dogs. I outweigh a lot of people. But, you know, I outweigh most dogs. I mean, you know, and if it came down to a fight, and I've been told my kids, if it came down to a fight, if your dad ever turns on a dog and we go at it, I will, I'm going to kill that dog. It's not going to be incapacitating. We, we're, it, if, I, if me and him go at it, it's going to be life. It's going to be, I'm going to be punch, poking out eyes, whatever I need to do. You know, that's what's going to happen. You know, but until that moment, I'm really scared. But you know what my first feeling is when a dog barks at me? And not even a big dog. It can be a smaller dog, you know, that barks at me. You know what my first feeling is to do? Run. Yes, run. Run. Run away. As fast as I can. What's the last thing you need to do if a dog is ferociously challenging you? Run away. Because what they're going to do, if you run, they're going to challenge you. My feeling is the worst thing in the world. What I think I should do, what I feel like I should do, is the worst thing in the world. A lot of times my feelings don't live in conjunction with reality. They live opposite of what reality is. You know, my brother-in-law, I love it. We, get there, we go to my, my in-law's house. I love my in-laws. They're awesome. You know, and I'm not just saying this because this is on tape. But, you know, I, <laughs> our Facebook Live, you know, it's okay. I love Marie and John, and I'm not sucking up, I promise. Okay? All right, so it, it, the, the deal is this. I mean, I, I, I love them, and we, we, we hang out a lot of times, but they got a dog next door at the neighbor's, and that dog is always, like, loudly barking. And if it ever gets out of the fence... I'm, I'm instantly afraid. Well, my brother-in-law, you know, he's like, what, what is he? I, I, the dog's running over toward us, and I'm, I'm, I'm beating it for the house, you know, because I, I think I can beat it, you know, to the, to the house. And he kind of stops and look at it. And the dog comes running up to him, and he's going, ah, and my brother-in-law is just like, ah, 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 right in the guy's face. You know, and the dog's just like, what am I, he, I don't know if he's taking off guard or something. And, he, and I'm like, what are you doing? Are you nuts? You know, and Don's like, what's he going to do, Jim? Bite my leg? I mean, I could kill him by the time he's trying to chew through my jeans. Come on. What are you going to do, big man? He's, I mean, you can take this. It's a dog, you know? And he's right. He's a children's minister. But, uh, <laughs> trying to take out dogs. That doesn't really look good on the resume there. Talking about how he can incapacitate dogs. But he's absolutely right. I feel like I need to run. But the truth is, if the dog bit my leg, I could drop the hammer. Of all, I could just fall on him and kill him, you know, if I hit the right place. I mean, you know what I mean? But our feelings are not things that are the most awesome things for us. Our feelings don't always drive us toward truth. They just don't. My feelings are often contrary to reality. They don't work in conjunction with it at all. You know, and sometimes we fall victim to that. How do I don't know. We, you know, look. We, that's just not with dogs. That's in our lives. You know, that 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 dude at work. He is a complete jerk. So I I know that God would be totally okay if I went behind his back and sabotaged him and made everybody love me, because he's a jerk to everybody. But I love her. She's not my wife. But I feel this incredible love for her, and I know God wouldn't allow me to feel this incredible love. You know, so it would be okay. Even though she's not my wife. My wife should understand that doesn't work. No, just don't do that. But our feelings can lie to us. And if we put too much weight on our feelings, we're going to wait a long time. And I heard a boat, I heard, I heard a joke one time, a boat, I heard a joke uh, one time. It's one of the few jokes I know and I, I screw it up all the time. But I'm going to tell it to you anyway because it makes a point <laughs> about feelings. You know, I heard there was a guy one time and, he, and the, the flood waters were rising. It was a flood. It's flash flood and he lived in a flood zone. You know, and so, so the, flood, the flood waters were rising and he prayed to God. He said, God, I want you to save me. And so, you know, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and, 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 and some people came by in like four, you know, in a four by four and they said, hey, do you need any help? We're going to get you. He said, no, God's going to save me. And so they drove off, you know, and the waters kept rising. He kept praying, God's going to save me. God, I want you to save me. I want you to do this. Save me. Show up. Show up big, God. And then somebody drives by, you know, the waters had gotten high enough. They come out in a little bitty boat, you know, and they're like, hey, do you need any help? We got you. Come on, ride with us. We'll get you out of here. Nope, nope. God's going to save me. So he kept on praying. The waters got higher and higher, and he had to climb up on the house. So he's on the roof. He's praying, God, will you please come save me? Somebody comes by in a helicopter, and they yell down, hey, dude. We could throw you down a rope. We'll get you out of here. That's okay. God's going to save me. And so, you know what happened. They flew off. Floodwaters rose. And he drowned. And he goes to heaven. 
And this is a terrible theological statement, but for the joke, it works. He saw Peter at the Holy Gates. He walked in. You know, he said, God, God, what's up? I prayed. I had faith. I asked you for this stuff. And then God was like, well, I, sent a, I sent a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? <laughs> a lot of times we can get so wrapped up in our feelings and how we think things should be that we miss reality that's standing right in front of us. And we can miss God working all around of us because we have decided, like the disciples, about the manna and the way God did it way back then. You know, bread falling from the sky. Why didn't you do that? You know, that God, if he didn't do it like he did it, he's not doing anything now. And that's just not true. That's just not true. I'll tell you another reason that you might not feel God. Your heart might be hardened. And Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 13. And this is what he talked about. He said, you will... Be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. And what had happened is, is you can get to such a place where you, your heart has become so hard... That you can't hear God. And you can always pull off the cheery face, right? Everybody can do a good fake, right? You, hey, how you doing? I mean, if you don't believe it, fight with your wife and have somebody call that you want to talk nicely to. I can't believe it. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> doing okay? Yeah. We're blessed in Jesus. Yes, we are. I mean, you know, you can pull that off, right? You know, and I have never done... I'm kidding. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you can pull that off. But you know what you can't pull off? You can't pull off your heart. You can't fake that. You know, you can come to church and you can serve in all the things and you can be it every time and you can raise your hands when the song comes up because you know that's what is supposed to happen. And you can know all the, the cool jargon and you can know the things to say in life group uh, you know, that lets everybody, I, I'm okay. You can do that. People can do that. But your heart can become so hard. And you want to know when your heart becomes calloused, when it becomes hardened, you know, when it becomes like, you know, when you play guitar, these guys who play guitar, they have to play guitar long enough that, they're, that they develop calluses on the end of their fingers. And the reason that is, is because, you know, if you've ever just played guitar one time, your fingers hurt like the dickens the next day because you've just been pressing steel wire against your, you know, just cutting into your fingers. And you develop calluses so that it won't hurt anymore. And the problem is, is when you have pushed and said no to God, it begins when you say no to God the first time. That's when it begins. You know, like, God's crazy. You don't want me to do that. That's nuts. I'm not going to do that. I mean, God, you just, you, just, you just be the God of everything else in my life except that part. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I have a special circumstance. I'm a little bit smarter than everyone. I don't need that, God. You know, that, that you just don't get it. And, and, and that's the moment that you begin to develop a hard heart. And you continue to tell him no. And see what we think. Here's the fallacy of all of it. We think if we can tell God no in one area, that it's just going to be that one area. It's going to be okay. Well, we'll just be, we'll just have this thing right here. And somewhere before I die, we may work this out. But here's what, what happens. Is you don't callous one area of your heart. You callous the whole thing. And you just don't recognize it until it's already done. And you don't see the need to go to church anymore. And you can't feel anything anymore. And you walk away. And your heart is hard. It begins when you start telling God no. It's almost like when you go outside where it's very cold. Maybe, I mean, I go, I go back anywhere it's cold now. It's like... 30 degrees. And I go anywhere and I'm like bringing out the parkas and the gloves and you know and all that type of stuff and putting them over and you, what you try to do is cover every piece of skin on your body so that you can't feel the cold. It's like you don't, I mean it's like you don't even know the cold is there. If you had like stuff you could put over your eyes you would do this. I mean but you may have a hole and all this stuff you know a hole in your mask or whatever it is. And you're, you're there but you can't you can't physically feel what the outside and the wind blowing because you've covered your body so much you can't and so you do that you can do that with your heart you can cover it with a lot of justifications you can cover it with a lot of desires you can cover it with a lot of stubbornness you can cover it with a lot of things there's a lot of tools you can use on that but it puts your heart at a place where you and God are separate and I want to tell you something if you know something God has said in his word that is right for you to do or wrong for you not to do, and you can continue, you continue doing that, and you fight God on that, and you don't feel that, you're starting to feel not guilty about that, it's one of two things. You're, not either, follow, you're either not following Jesus or you're developing such a hard heart that you can't hear me when you need to be careful with that. 
careful with that. But it could be that your heart is hardened. I'll tell you another thing. And this is a cool deal. That was, that, was a, that was a tough one. But here's a good one. Sometimes when you don't feel like God, it's because He's trying to pull you closer. He's trying to pull you closer to Him. And why does God do anything like that? In, in, in Acts 17, we see this. And this is a great verse. Look at this. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Though He is not far from any one of us. It's talking about all the things of life. Why did God do the things that he does? Why does God create the scenarios he creates? It's so that we might seek him and perhaps reach out for him. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. You know, I, I don't know about you. When I had a kid and they were trying to walk, a lot of times I would be the mean dad. I would try to get them to walk. I would go, okay. They cru you know, they cruise, right? You know, they like walk across the furniture and they're holding on to stuff they don't want to step on out, right? And what I would do is just get far enough away. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And as they're trying to reach out, I'm just, you know, I'm easing back, you know, and I'm stepping away. Come on, come on. I'm almost there. I'm not touching you. You don't feel me touching you, but it's like I am. Come on. You know, I'm going to step on back. I'm going to step on back. And then here, here they go. And, and they would step out, and I would back up, and they would take a couple steps to me. I said, see, you walked. Look at that. That's awesome. There is nothing more awesome in your life than when your child reaches out and does something more than what they could have done and they do it because they trusted you. We are his offspring. And it's the same for him. Sometimes God does not have his arms around us and we don't feel it right there, but he's just right off. He's saying, look, I need you to step over here. Come in closer to me. I need you to come, come, on, come. I need you to do this. Come on, come, come on. Right here. Come on, come on, come on. And those are the moments that you need to step closer to Jesus. Those are the moments you need to say, okay, all right, if I don't feel the Lord, there must be something. I need to dive back into the Word. I need to see what God wants me to do. Is there anything? I mean, a lot of times when I, if I don't feel God, I'm going, okay, God, is there anything I need to do? Is there anything I've told you no on? I research that. I go back in my life and I think about that. Why? Is there something that I missed? Because here's the truth. Not feeling God is part of the design. Those times that you don't, it's part of the design of following him. And you may think, well, that's nuts, Jim. That didn't make any sense at all. He's trying to develop a relationship with him. We should always feel each other and everything like that. No, I'm going to tell you how I know that. Hebrews 1.11 says this. It says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. In other words, faith is the confidence about what we don't, we can't grasp or put our hands on or, or feel. And Hebrews 11.6 says this. It is impossible to please God without what? Faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It doesn't say anyone who wants to come to him must feel him all over their body and scream and yell and on an awesome emotion 24 hours a day. I couldn't even do that. I'm an emotional guy. That would drive me nuts. But you know what he says? He says you must believe that God exists. In other words, that he's there even when you don't feel it. And you must believe that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. In other words, that he's there and that he will do what he says he's going to do. If we truly seek after him, he'll deliver on his promises. But you're going to have to go hard after that. You know what a lot of people are like? They're almost like the skydiver that wants to dive skydive and feel the rush and adrenaline of, of flying through the air before you pull the parachute or whatever. But you don't want to let go of the plane. You can't have it both ways. And here's the reality. You never feel the presence of God until, truly in a full way until you begin to follow. God, you, don't, you don't feel God feel him all this time and he gives you all this evidence and all this stuff right here of feelings for yourself and then you find a lot of times that's where you hit. you don't feel the presence of God until you're truly following him that's kind of how it works you can have an emotional experience but I'm telling you if you're not following Jesus and you think like you felt the Lord you haven't felt him fully yet, fully yet. and that's the thing for us you know I heard uh, and if you're in a dark season you know and because we all get in those and it's true but I'm going to give you a piece of advice that was given to me. 
you know, and, and it's a pastor said this, and, and I'm not going to come up with it, you know. Uh, it actually was originated from a guy named uh, V. Raymond Edmund who died before I was born. He was a pastor. And he said, had a famous quote that he carried on. It's carried on through after guy, after guy, after guy, but it's really great. And he says, don't doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. Amen. And in those moments that we have seen God and heard God and heard what he said, we don't need to doubt that when we can't feel him. Or when it's a dark season. Because here's the reality. My feelings don't do anything to make something exist or not exist or something true or not true. With God, He is true and it is truth. And whether I believe it or I don't, it is the reality that we're all going to have to deal with at some point or another. And my feelings don't change that. They only change how I react to it. And here's what you do with feelings. You know how if you're if you're if you feel if you're hung up on feelings, you need to trust God first, then worry about feelings later. Now they have a place. They're not terrible. Here's the thing: if you if your heart is hard, you need to act on the truth in the area that you first said no. I'm not going to do it because uh, this is what I found. Out. I know, you know I'm going to be honest with you. What I found in my life is that when I tell God no about something, there's a problem. And eventually, at some point, no matter what, how I want to ignore it, he's going to bring me back around to that. Back again. Whatever it was. It may not be the same situation, but it's going to be the principle that I used in my heart. That, 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 that area that I won't give up, that I told him no about, he's going to be back to that. And I'm going to have to, at some point, deal with it. Because he's not going to run me away from it. He may just like work on me a little bit and then bring me back to it. But it's coming back. What area did you told him no in? Or maybe he's just trying to get you to go one step closer. That may be what's up. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's a couple action steps this week. And one, I want you to do this. Always override your feelings with truth. You know, just like I have to do with a dog and realize I cannot just go with my feelings and run. I know the truth is that dog is probably going to chase me down at that point. You know, or if it comes to fighting, we're going to have to deal with it. But... Always override the feelings with truth. And you can always trust God's word. God's, we've learned through this series. That God, look, I'm faithful. I don't change. I'm going to tell you what's right. And my ways are always right. We learned that God doesn't love us because we keep the rules. But he puts the rules there to help us know that we need him. But all the rules and things that he puts in place, those are always wise. They're always going to work out for our long-term best. And for the best of those around us. Anytime we go against that, regardless of what we think... Because his ways are much higher than ours. And he's got so many things on his plate that he, he's dealing with that we don't understand. You know, that's, gonna, that's a deal. So we, we always override feelings with truth. And the second thing is this. I want you to make your decisions on God's truth. Not your feelings. When you... It's one thing to say, okay, okay, I feel really this. I know the truth is that. Now you have to take it a step further and say, since the truth is that... This is how I'm going to react to it. And if you want to know, I've said this so often, everybody follows Jesus until he says something they don't like. And then you find out. You know, because there's, thing God, you know, there's a lot of theology on that, but here's the thing for us. When you want to follow Christ, it means that you trust him. You trust him. Even when you don't understand it, you trust him even when you don't have any evidence of it. You trust him even when you feel differently about it. You trust him even when somebody else is telling you here or there or yon or wherever that you don't know what you're talking about. You still trust him and you react on the truth that he has for you. And you don't bow to the goosebumps God because the God that's just feelings doesn't exist. Thanks for being a part of Bay West today. Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Please feel free to check us out at baywestchurch.org or you can follow us on Facebook at Bay West Church.